Okay, now let's look at a simple example. Let's say on a frictionless surface, I have two particles, A and B, and A is moving with velocity Va minus, B is moving with the velocity Vb minus, and then after a while, you know, A catches up with B because maybe Va minus is larger than Vb minus, and they hit against each other. So this is, you know, before the impact and at the time of impact, a and B are together for an, for a while, and let me call this impact. And this impact, of course, is not going to last very long. And then after the impact, they continue to move, but of course with different velocities. So let's say this is moving with velocity V A plus, B is moving with velocity V B plus. Okay. So V A minus could be different from V A plus. V B minus could be different from V B plus. So. So what we want to see is how the method learned in this particular module would make your life simpler in determining some of the pre-impact as well as post-impact velocities, right? So the process to solve the problems in this chapter is to first look at the free body diagram. And I'm going to give you a general method a little bit later. Let's first look at some of the examples. So, so the time of impact, if we draw the free body diagram, we have to draw free body diagram of the system, okay? And we will also draw free body down the individual particles to see what happens. So A and B, we have over here. We have the normal reactions on both of them. Let's call it N sub A and N sub B. We have the gravity. So we have NAG, we have NBG. Okay, we are assuming it's a frictionless surface, so there's no friction. So these are only forces acting on the two particles. And it's clear that none of these forces are impulsive forces because these forces were acting on the particles even before the impact and at the time of impact there is no reason to believe that any of these forces would change. Gravity of course doesn't change, even the normal reactions would not change, right? So for two particles which are assumed to be uh, of no size and shape, of course these normal reactions uh, would be same as before, right? Now there will be forces acting on the particle A and B which would be impulsive forces applied by the particles themselves, right? So on A, there will be a force on B, and on B, there will be a force on A. But as far as the free body of the system is concerned, this is A and B together, those forces are internal, so we don't show them, right? Okay, let's draw a free body diagram of individual particles. So on A, we have normal reaction, we have the gravity, and then we have reaction from B acting on it. Free body diagram of the B looks similar, we have B, we have the weight of B, we have the normal reaction, and then the same reaction R that B was applying on A is the reaction applied on B by A, but opposite in direction, right? Now clearly R is an impulsive force, so R is an impulsive force. Why is it an impulsive force? Because at the time of impact, this force can be as large as possible, almost approaching infinity in magnitude, without violating the hard constraints that A and B cannot go through each other, right? But there's no such condition applied on MA and B, MA and B, MAG and MBG, so they are not impulsive forces. So if we were to draw a free body diagram that what we call would be an impact or impulse uh, relevant free body diagram, then we would sometimes not show MA, G, and A as well as these two forces, and we'll only show the impulsive forces, right? So when we say draw an impact relevant free body diagram, in that free body diagram, you should neglect non-impulsive forces and show only impulsive forces. So now let's look at the system, right? And on the system, what are the external forces acting on the system? Well, there are no external forces acting on the system as far as impulsive forces are concerned, right? Even if you were to consider these non-impulsive forces, they're acting in the vertical direction along which the particles don't move. So we can clearly see that in the x direction, so let's say this is positive x direction, in the positive x direction, there are no external forces acting on the system. So we can say that sigma f external is zero, right? And sigma f external on the system, so let me say system, right? And that means that the linear momentum, linear momentum of the system is constant or conserved, right? So before the impact, the linear momentum of the system should be same as the linear momentum of the system after the impact. And that, that's mean, that means we are saying that we can apply conservation of linear momentum principle to this particular problem. So let's write the momentum of the system before the impact. So we'll call it P1 system. I can also write it as P minus system to indicate this is 
before the impact. So that is equal to mass of A, velocity of A, plus mass of B times velocity of B. This is before impact. After the impact, P2 system, also written sometimes as P of the system, plus, to indicate post-impact, is MA, VA plus, plus MB, VB plus. And we don't have to worry about the signs over here because all the motion is along one direction, positive X, so which means that the sign, plus or minus sign, can indicate which direction uh, the velocities are acting, right? So P1 of system is equal to P2 of system. So we can write MA VA minus plus MB VB minus equal to MA post impact velocities multiplied by the masses, right? So if let's say we knew, we knew the initial velocities of the two particles, and we were looking for post-impact velocities, then we would have two unknowns, right? So we have two unknowns and there's only one equation. Clearly, we cannot solve for both unknowns from one equation. So what do we need? We need one more equation that would relate the two post-impact velocities. So where do we get the another equation from, right? To get the another equation, we would have to look at what happens at the time of impact, okay? So what happens at the time of impact is when the two particles A and B come together, when they come together, this is at the time of impact, there is a phase where the particles A and B are pushing against each other and they're essentially deforming each other, okay? So A could be deforming and B could be deforming, all right? So this is the shape of A and this is the shape of B, right? This is the phase one, which we call phase one, which we call deformation phase, okay? Then after a while, so while these two particles are still in contact with each other due to their elastic properties or maybe non-elastic properties, the two particles could either separate from each other or could stick against each other, right? So assuming that, you know, they do actually come apart, they don't stick to each other, then while they're traveling together for a moment at the time of impact, they begin to regain their shape, okay? So that's phase two. So there's a phase two of this impact process called restoration phase. Called restoration phase. So the, at the time of impact, there are two things going on. In just a couple of milliseconds or three milliseconds, the two particles tend to deform each other and then they begin to regain their shape that is called restoration phase. And during both the phases, the particles are still together. So they have not really separated from each other. But as soon as the restoration phase is over, the two particles separate in general from each other. And then they continue to move with some post-impact velocities. Okay. So if you draw a free body diagram of A in the phase one, so deformation, let me write deformation phase. If you draw a free body diagram of A, you have a force, let's call it F sub, uh, let me, let's call it P, okay? So we'll call it P. Call it P. And if you look at the free body diagram of B, you have the same force P applied on B, okay? And we're not drawing normal reaction in gravity because those are non-impulsive forces. So in this particular module, whenever there's an impact, we're only looking at Impulse, uh, impulsive forces in the free body diagram, not the non-impulsive forces, because the non-impulsive forces do not give rise to this change in linear momentum that we see, okay? So, at the time when the impact is happening, the two particles are moving together, and let's say they are moving together with some velocity u, okay? Now, remember, this is an intermediate velocity while they are moving, well, when they are together. As soon as they separate, they will, they will have a different velocity. So, the particle A has gone from moving at a speed, so this is A, this is B. So A has gone from moving at a velocity VA minus to now moving at a velocity U at the time of impact. And the same thing is ha has happened with B, which has gone from moving with a velocity VB minus to a common velocity U. So at the time of impact, A and B are moving together, they have the same velocity U, okay? So from the impact momentum principle, we, we can write integral for a we can write integral p dt so let's say this is positive x direction so this is minus p dt this is equal to 
change in momentum of A, right? So minus integral P dt, which is the inverse, is equal to mass of A times the velocity of A, right? That's U minus MA times V A minus, right? That's the change in linear momentum of A. So this change is from some pre-impact velocity to the time of impact when, they're two, when the two particles are together. You can write a similar equation for V, so this will be plus integral PDT because P is pointing towards plus X, equal to mass of B times its common velocity U minus MB, VB minus, right? Now from these two equations, we can actually determine what this common, common velocity is, right? So how should we solve for this? We can uh, add these two quantities together or uh, we can subtract them, right? So we're looking for U, but what I want to do is I want to actually get integral PDT by getting rid of U. So what I can do is I can multiply this equation with MB and I can multiply this equation with MA and then subtract. So let's say this is one, this is two, and I can subtract two from one and that would get rid of this term U from here and I will get uh, integral PDT. So if I you know go ahead and do that, let's see what we get. We get integral PDT equal to MA times MB over M A plus M B, okay, times uh, this will be V A minus minus V B minus, right? So we get rid of U. And another way you could do this is you could solve for U from one and then substitute into the equation two and get integral P D T. Okay, so this gives us basically the impulse of the deformation force, right? So this is nothing but impulse or linear impulse of deformation force. Okay, so impulse deformation force is obtained completely in terms of the mass of the two particles and the pre-impact velocity, right? Now we can repeat this analysis for the restoration phase as well. So let's see what happens during the restoration phase. Restoration phase. So we have particle A, we have particle B, and we have, let's say, a force, uh, we'll call it Q, not or R, we use P over there, so we call it Q, and the force of restitution is, is Q, okay? In general, the force of restoration is going to be less than the force of deformation, okay? All right, so at this time also, the particles are moving with the same constant velocity U, but as soon as this phase is over, the A, particle A would be moving with post-impact velocity V, A plus, and v, B would be moving with, with post-impact velocity V, B plus. All right, so this is the chain. Now let's apply the uh, impulse momentum method to both A and B. So for an A, it is minus integral Q dt equal to mass of A. The change in momentum is V A plus, that's the force impact velocity, minus U. So is this U the same as what we saw before? And for B, it is plus integral Q dt equal to MB, V B plus minus U. Again, let's call it three and four, and we want to get rid of u from these two and get integral q dt. So if we repeat the same analysis, we get integral q dt equal to m a times m b over m a plus m b times v b plus minus v a plus. Okay, so now this is interesting. So we have integral p dt from here and we have integral Q dt from here, okay? So these are basically the impulses of deformation and impulse of restoration force. So this is impulse of restoration force, okay? Ratio of these two forces, integral Q dt over integral P dt is defined a quantity called coefficient of restitution coefficient of restitution. So E is defined as a ratio of the impulse of, of restoration force and impulse of deformation phase, a uh, deformation uh, force. And in general, because Q is less than or equal to P, E is between zero to one, okay? So 
it can be either zero, which is the case when you know integral q dt would be zero, or it can be one when integral q dt would be same as integral p dt. And there are special names given to each of these cases when e is zero, when e is one, and so on. All right. So we say that e is zero for plastic impact when e is between 0 and 1 so it's not 0 it's not 1 but it's in between this is called an elastic impact when e is equal to 1 this is called a perfectly perfectly elastic impact this is a special case and you also have something called perfectly plastic impact which is when two particles stick with each other after the impact so particles in, they come together you know, imagine you know there was glue on them or something like that and they impacted and they got stuck into each other and they moved together after the impact that's called a perfectly plastic impact now in general remember that you cannot conserve mechanical energy at the uh, before and after the impact because during the impact there's always some deformation okay if there was no deformation of course then we would have a problem we wouldn't be able to you know get this expression where we relate the impulse of restoration forces with the uh, impulse of deformation forces so in general there is always some loss of energy there's always some loss of mechanical energy so things are deforming against each other this it takes energy to deform things right if you hear two particles colliding against each other that means you are hitting the sound energy which came from the kinetic energy of the particles before the impact right there's always some friction there is always going to be some heat generated in the process which means that mechanical energy in general is not going to be conserved uh, in the impact right so let me write that because this is important so do not conserve mechanical energy before and after impact unless now this is a special case unless you have unless it is a perfectly elastic impact so unless the problem says that the impact is a perfectly elastic impact, in which case E is actually equal to 1, right? This is the case when we say that the force is the deformation of force of restitution, so there is there is no loss of mechanical energy as such, then only you can apply conditional mechanical energy principle. Otherwise, please don't try to you know equate the kinetic energy of the system before and after the impact. Okay, that in general won't be true.